So the last talk in the session is, a, uh, is titled Masking Proofs are Tight and How to Exploit It in Security Evaluations. And it's a paper by Vincent Grosso and François-Xavier Standard. And François-Xavier is giving the talk. Okay, so um, thank you. I will start with a, a few words of introduction. And So, um, so motivation. Uh, the motivation for the talk is actually essentially the, the current situation in the evaluation of, of uh, cryptographic implementations against high channel attacks, which is a bit simplified in the left part of the slide. And essentially, the idea is that if you have an implementation here represented by this black chip and you want to know how secure it is against high channel attacks, you would send it to a laboratory and the laboratory will, will try all sorts of attacks and in the best case you will get something like this figure, which I would call um, a security graph, which gives you on x-axis the number of measurements that you need to recover the key, on, y, on the y-axis the amount of computation that you need to recover the key and the grade scale is the success rate of, for example, a key recovery attack. And in, in this example, of course, it's a pretty simple to interpret situation between, because with two to the 30 measurements, which is like days to weeks of, com of computations, we recover the key with, with a good probability and little computation. And the, the situation we are interested in in this paper is when this does not hold. So imagine that with these two to the 30 measurements, which is essentially what the lab can afford, we don't recover the key. And that may mean different things. Maybe it's just that you need a little bit more measurement, like to the 40 would give you the key. Or maybe it means that it's an extremely secure implementation, and with two to the 80 measurements, you would not get the key, which would be much better. And uh, the, the approach that we would like to propose in the work is essentially to leverage two things. First is the fact that we will play with completely open designs. So the idea that is that, like we would do in, in block cipher code analysis, all the implementation details are public to the evaluator and therefore the adversary. And we would like to combine this with all this body of work that we have in, in masking security proofs or proofs of countermeasures against high channel attacks in order to get something like here, what I will denote as proof-based evaluation. And the hope is to be able to claim much higher security levels like to the 90 or something like that. Um, and of course, admittedly, maybe the chip will, will blow up, right? I'm, I'm not at all speaking about performance for the moment. The only question we tackle in the paper is, is it, paper, is, is it possible to have or to claim high security guarantees for cryptographic implementations? Um, ideally, we would like to do that with any type of countermeasures that we have in the literature. As a first step, we start with the masking. Uh, the main reason being is that there's a very large and nice body of work doing formal and, and theoretical analysis of masking, so there's a lot of, of proofs that we can leverage in order to, to reason about that. Um, this has been a bit explained already, so I will be brief, but the idea with masking is that whenever you want to manipulate some, some secret variable like the Y here, you're going to split it in D shares that are represented here. And this can be analyzed, for example, in this abstract probing model introduced by Ishai Sahai and Wagner um, 15 years ago. And in this case, if the adversary is able to observe up to D minus one probes, he will not learn anything about the secret. And of course, if the adversary can probe all the wires, then he gets the secret in full. And that looks a little bit abstract, but the, the idea is that, or the hope when we introduce that, is that, um, if we now implement this encoding in, into a hardware device or a smart card, and that's an example with all the shares manipulated in, in a serial implementation, then we will get this thing that we usually call a leakage trace or a power consumption trace. So these are really the measurements that the adversary sees. Um, in the serial case, the first share is manipulated here, and then later on the second share, and so on. And um, what we hope in this case is that um, even if we give all these leakage samples to the adversary, 
we will have some kind of, of uh, concrete security that has been formalized as noisy leakage security by uh, proof and revamp. And as such, it's not directly obvious that one, one is related to the other because in, in the probing security model, we really exclude one probe uh, from the adversary's view, while in the, the noisy leakage security, the adversary gets all the leakages of all the shares. And there's a very nice result by, by Duke, Jambowski, and Faust um, in 2014 showing that one actually implies the other, which is extremely convenient because, as said in the previous talk, it's much easier to do proofs with probing security, and in the end, we are more interested in noisy leakage security. Um, for the proof to hold, with, we essentially need two things. One is uh, noise, so we need that every sample in this leakage trace is sufficiently noisy. And one is independence, which essentially means that the, every of these, or each of these leakage samples depends only on, on one share. And that, for example, can be guaranteed if you assume it's a serial implementation and everything is well separated in time. Um, and then concretely, we can use these this, uh, usual formulas, right? Based on this, we know that the, the number of samples that we need to recover a key will be inversely proportional to the mutual information between the target variable here, y, and the, the vector or the matrix with all the leakage samples. And uh, this can be bounded by the mutual information for only one share and the corresponding leakages raised to the power d, which is, of course, much more convenient. So what, what do we want to do here? In fact, in previous work, we showed that these, these masking proofs, they are reasonably tight for uh, just the encoding. So we always can mount attacks that exploit essentially all the information that is in the leakages. What we want to do in this work is to look at what happens if we have more complex circuits which is, of course, more, rele more relevant to practi practice. So, for example, we would like to look at the AESS box uh, made of simple gadgets like additions and multiplication. And uh, yeah, this is typically the example we are going to look at. So this is uh, the AESS box represented as a sequence of squaring and multiplication operations. And I exclude the final affine transformation. So this is really just the multiplicative inf inverse in GF256. Um, and then the second thing that we want to show is that these, these proofs that we have in the, the more theoretical li literature, they are quite useful to simplify security evaluations. Um, and this is, of course, still under the noise and independence uh, assumptions that we always need for masking. And particular to this work, for now, we are limited to divide and conquer attacks. So I mean, we consider adversary that either exploit the first round leakages or the last round leakages in a block cipher. Okay, so for the outline, what I'm going to do is essentially discuss or describe the evaluation settings that we consider, and then I'll try to describe a couple of case studies. And the idea or what, what the goal of, of these case studies is to show that as we increase the number of shares in a masking scheme, um, the worst case uh, evaluation requires more and more time. Right? At some point, it just becomes completely prohibitive to analyze these things exhaustively. And then based on masking security proofs and certain assumptions, we can actually uh, still claim something uh, relevant about high security devices. And then I will discuss what it means in practice, so whether the, these worst case bounds that we obtain are needed or not, and, and conclude. So for the settings, um, as I said, we consider the AESS box or the, the, the inverse part of the AESS box. So I now have this key addition and 10 intermediate values uh, in this uh, addition and multiplication chain. And the first thing that we look at is this uh, C1 adversary. So this, this is really the simplest possible adversary who only tries to exploit the information that is at the end of the S-box. Um, and so that means I will use this notation in general. And we have the leakage matrix, which is really all the samples that the adversary could use. Um, we have here uh, leakage vectors with the bar notation, and that means only the leakage for one d-tuple, and every d-tuple is made of several samples corresponding to the d-shells. And for the C1 adversary, he only uses the Y10 intermediate value, so the leakage matrix is just one leakage vector. And of course, we cannot claim this is the best adversary because uh, obviously there's an adversary who could try to exploit all the intermediate values in the DSBox computation. Um, and in this, guy, in, in this case, uh, the adversary gets really a leakage matrix made of uh, 10 leakage vectors. 
And we have, in fact, an even more powerful adversary, which is the C3 adversary, which is taking into account the fact that all these multiplication box that we have here now in red are never done instantaneously because they have to be secure multiplications. If you look, and that, that's related to the previous talk too, how this is implemented is at least by performing all the partial prof products, doing some kind of refreshing and compressing. But that means what we had previously for the encoding is a D tuple, and here we have a D square tuple, for example, or even a 2D square tuple if we consider the fact that all these field multiplications, usually if you play with a GF256, it's implemented with a log and a log tables. Um, yeah. And then for, for the rest, everything we do is, is using a very standard setting. So we consider 8-bit values because it's the AES. Uh, we consider a Hamming weight leakage function with a Gaussian noise. Um, the noise variance is, is this uh, sigma square n. For simplicity, or I think it's a bit more visual, we, we use the signal to noise ratio as a parameter, which is the variance of an 8-bit random value, uh, the Hamming weight of these 8 bits divided by the noise variance. And all I'm going to discuss here in the talk is based on the assumption that all the noise samples are independent, which is usual, but in fact in the paper we also discuss what happens if uh, noise is correlated. And then what I mean by worst case evaluation, I think there's many, way to express, many ways to express this. One possible way is to say when we want to evaluate the worst case security of an implementation, we want to evaluate the mutual information between the key the plain text X, that's public knowledge, and the matrix of all the leakages. And that means if I want to compute that, I will have to sum over all the keys, over all the, all the plain text, over all the shared vectors, and then perform this uh, delta dimension uh, integral. And that really means integrating the, the noise samples over all the possible uh, dimensions that I have. So we have, if I have an implementation with many points in time, I need to, to take all this into account. And I guess it's easy to see that this rapidly becomes very difficult to, to compute just from a time complexity point of view by just looking at the shares vectors because we know those ones, they increase exponentially in T. So now moving to, to case studies, um, the simplest case is, is if the number of shares is one or two. So one would be unprotected, um, so no masking at all. Two is the minimum masking that we can do. We consider the simplest adversary targeting only the output of the S-box. And then, of course, exhaustive analysis is possible. That's what we did here. And uh, the blue curve, so what do we have here? The, the, sorry, the first, first thing, the x-axis is the signal to noise ratio. So if I move on the left, um, on the right here, I have very limited noise. And if I move on the left here, this is when I have a lot of noise in my measurements. The blue curve is the unprotected S-box. The red curve is the masked S-box. So we see that there's a security gain. We see that when we don't have enough noise, which is strictly what the proofs require, masking doesn't, doesn't help much. But when I have enough noise, uh, there's this exponential security gain, uh, thanks to masking. And typically, how to inter interpret this is that if my device gives me this amount of noise, and I have this final point where the mutual information is 10 to the minus 6, that means that I will need a small multiple of 10 to the 6 samples to recover the key. Or samples meaning measurements here. Um, so that's the C1 adversary. If we move to the C2 adversary, so the guy exploiting the, the 10 uh, d-tuples in the implementation, we can still do exhaustive analysis. It takes more time, but it's feasible, and it's done in the paper. That gives us the, the green curve. So we see that by, by taking advantage of everything that's there in the implementation, we have um, weaker security guarantees. Um, and interestingly, if we want to go much faster, in fact, by just taking advantage the, the, uh, of the assumption that the leakage of different operations is independent, then we can, we can have this bond that is very accurate in, in this particular case. And, and this goes much faster because then the mutual information between the key and the leakage matrix is just 10 times the, the mutual information for one leakage vector. Um, the interesting bit is that this is a conservative assumption because if we have dependencies for, the, op uh, for the, the operations, then essentially we can only decrease the mutual information. So that even if it doesn't hold at this stage, it is not a problem. Um, then, of course, the, the, the difficult bit is if we increase D, uh, rapidly it's impossible to, to compute these curves even for the, the C1 adversary. 
So here again, I, I change the scale, but it's the same plot for D1 and D2. Um, if we want to go further, what we usually do is to assume independent shares leakage, so ISL. And again, this leads to much faster evaluation because then we can take advantage of this simple formula where the mutual information for one uh, D tuple is the mutual information for one share and the corresponding leakage is raised to the power D. So it really means that based on these two curves, I, I'm able to produce all the dotted curves, uh, which are essentially bounds on the mutual information. And we see that if we set the parameters properly, um, the red bound, which is for, for two shares, is good. And, and then we can predict the security for implementations with actually large number of shares at this stage only for the encoding. Um, and of course, if we want to, to now look at what happens for the full S box, which is more practically relevant, we need to, um, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say, this one is of course a critical uh, assumption because if independence between the, the shares leakage does not hold, then we reduce security exponentially. That, that's why this is an assumption that's always there in the, the masking security proofs. So now multiplication leakage, right? If, if we want to analyze what happens for the, the full S box, the full S box has this, this uh, squaring and multiplication, so we need to take this into account. And essentially, exhaustively, things become even more, even more difficult because even just doing this, this uh, delta square, uh, de de delta dimension integral takes a lot of time. So in the paper, what we did is look at two bit examples with uh, three shares, the red curve is a C1 adversary, so this one has three dimensions. The black curve is the optimal attack, taking advantage of the nine dimensions. And, and yeah, in this case, we can do exhaustively, not for larger number of shares, not for larger number of bits. Um, and the good news is that uh, there's one nice approximation for this mutual information, again relying on uh, the fact that the shares leakage is independent in the paper by Proof and Rivain in, uh, five years ago. And they explained that, or they showed that the mutual information for these D square partial products can be approximated by 172D, the mutual information for one D tuple. So that's, that's now this dashed curve. And we see that also, again, in these log scale plots, but it, it's reasonably tight, so we can use that. So now, now we have essentially all the tools to put things together because we know how to analyze the multiplication. If you look at, um, the, the, the squaring, since they are applied independently on all the shares, we can use the independent operation assumption. And we are able to build this kind of security graphs um, for full S boxes, for a large number of shares, for C1 and C2 and C3 adversaries. Here I only show the C1 and the C3 adversaries. So the color is the number of shares. So we see that, that yeah, when we go down, we have more and more security by increasing the number of shares, of course. Uh, the plane curve is the C1 adversary, the dashed curve is the C3 adversary, so we see that a, a more powerful adversary gives a, a less optimistic uh, claim about security. But still, it's, it's not too much, right? Because when we move from C1 to C3, essentially we see that the mutual information increases li linearly in the number of tuples, so essentially polynomially in, in D, because ultimately, this, this really relates to the circuit size parameter, right? If you compute more, you leak more, but since mask implementation remain reasonably efficient, this is, this is not a killer. Um, and, and the next point, which is probably the most interesting one in the paper, is that we can show with all this, and it's somehow known, I think, in the literature, but things get much, much worse if suddenly the adversary is able to average the share leakage. And, and we can take the example of ISW because that's one example where things actually are not that good. If we perform this, this uh, ISW multiplication, what happens is that every share is going to be manipulated D times. So here in the example, I have three shares and the A1 thing is going to be manipulated three times to perform these three partial products. So now imagine that the adversary knows that and has the, these three samples, noisy samples for this, the same share. What he can always do is average the shares leakage before doing anything else. And that means essentially the noise condition of masking decreases a lot and we will lose uh, security or increase mutual information exponentially in uh, D. And that's the same formula, but we really see that this time uh, the mutual information between one share and the corresponding samples that was raised to the power D, we first multiply it by D because of this averaging process. And that's really related to the noise condition in masking security proofs. 
This is exactly what we see on the figure with, with these uh, red lines, and that, that's really a, a big, big security loss since it's exponential. Essentially, if you move to high orders, what you lose is a factor d to the d, which is annoying. And that's, of course, an interesting ob observation because I think it's the first point in the talk when maybe there's a big difference or there is some difference between this adversary who knows all the implementation details and an adversary who doesn't know all the impl implementation details. Because I would say, as long as you exploit the tuples, I think knowing implementation details is very convenient for evaluation, but a black box adversary would probably do essentially the same because it's easy to detect these tuples. Now, if I give you a leakage trace and you have to detect when the same shares are manipulated again and again without looking at the source code, this is maybe some kind of difficult problem. And it's, I think it's a nice question to find out how realistic this is for black box adversaries. And then you choose what you want to consider. Of course, if you want to consider worst case security, I think that the message remains that uh, only this open approach will allow you to claim something strong. And uh, yeah, just before moving to, to practical relevance, um, there's an easy link to the big, bigger picture. Of course, I recall that it, whenever you get this mutual information, then you can directly connect this to, to works about key enumeration and key ranking and obtain bounds for this kind of security graph. So that's an example where the mutual information is 10 to the minus 7. And that's the corresponding security graph that we can build. And we see that with bit more than 10 to the 7 measurements, we, we recover the key. Good, so um, now, of course, one question is how relevant is all this? Because if, if I summarize the talk so far, what we showed is that um, when we want to evaluate the worst case security of an implementation, as we increase the number of shares, time complexity becomes bigger and bigger. And at some point, it's just impossible to just compute the PDF of, of the, the mask implementation, right? The Cosian mixture sums over all so many shares vectors that we cannot compute that efficiently. So time complexity increases, and then what we showed is that as an evaluator, we can use independent operation and shares uh, leakage assumption in order to speed up things. But one question could be uh, if you have this situation, is it so important to focus on worst case data complexity? Because again, if you look at these plots, um, what, what the mutual information gives you is an, a bound on the, the data complexity that you will need to attack, not on the time complexity. And uh, so yeah, is, is worst case data complexity an overkill? The short answer is I would say no. And the reason is that despite the worst case attack may be very difficult to mount, there's very frequently efficient attacks that are close enough to worst case. And I, I don't think you want to take this risk of, of distinguishing between close to worst case and worst case adversaries. We discussed that in the paper. paper. Um, the starting point is this uh, horizontal attack paper by Batistello et, and co-authors at Chess two years ago. Um, we re-implemented this one. That's the, this, this is the, the dotted curve. We can improve this attack a little bit by casting it as a soft analytic, analytical side channel attack, which is essentially exploiting belief propagation um, to recover information, that's, that's the plain curve here, and the black curve is the worst case adversary. This is again a small example where we could compute everything. Um, and as you can see, you, we get reasonably close, and, and, and for sure there's room for optimization for, for the attack here. Um, so these are the two things that we discussed. I would say there's also easy connection with these numerous works at the moment that look at machine learning based attacks. And the interesting bit is that machine learning attacks, they are actually working in a much more black box fashion. So one question is whether it answers this separation that I mentioned before or not. And uh, so that leads me to conclusion. I'd like to start with uh, one analogy. And the analogy is if, if you now design a block cipher and you want to claim security against linear cryptanalysis, I think you're not going to try many different attacks with bounded complexity. And what you are going to do rather is to look at the S-boxes, find a good di diffusion layer, do some independence assumption, and then maybe based on the white rail strategy or something else, claim security for a number of rounds. And I think the message here generally is that conceptually, I don't see reasons why this could be or should be different in the, the black box world, uh, especially now, I would say, where we have some good knowledge on, on how implementations behave. 
and the paper does one, one minor step in, uh, or first step in this direction, we applied the methodology to uh, an implementation of the AES masked with 32 shares. So that's maybe an overkill, but okay. for this one, we could claim uh, that security is good until two to the 60 measurements. And I think that's the first time that we can go that far. Um, and then, of course, this, this comes with limitations. Uh, I would say some limitations look hard to avoid. Um, one thing is that all these results, when I say they are tied, they are only tied in these log scale plots. Uh, this is totally correct. That means it applies, I think, for very high security levels. If you claim 2 to 60 security, you don't care about one bit more or one bit less or not too much. Um, if you now want to work with limited Ds, you have, of course, much more accurate solutions in the literature. We mentioned them in the paper to have tight security bounds, not in, in log scale plots. Um, we rely on strongly, heavily on noise and independence. I don't think we can avoid this as long as we play with masking. Um, it's very important in practice. That's the, the first talk. Um, it's somehow orthogonal, and, and yeah, there, there's also a big literature. The main example is threshold implementations, where uh, we show how we can implement circuits so that independence is guaranteed. Um, one third problem, and this is, I think, specific to our paper, we are limited to divide and conquer. Um, so <coughs> for sure, we could, when we work on that, we could try to extend this to any attack, so attacks that exploit all the leakage samples uh, in the block cipher. And the final thing is, I would say, concretely, the most striking conclusion or observation of the paper is that if the adversary is able to average the shares leakage, then we have an exponential security loss. So we could try to analyze this better, generalize it, and maybe fix the threat. And again, to, to fix it, there's a, the paper of, of uh, Battistello and co-authors where there's a first proposal. I think it's possible to do slightly better. That's it. Thank you. So we don't have much time for questions, but maybe a quick one. Oh, everybody's hungry. <laughs> One is that, okay, you see, once you have the D, your D in the implementation, you can do this kind of analysis, but I was, so I was wondering if this kind of analysis can actually help you choose the right D, because like, I don't know, when you come up with an implementation, I mean, choosing the D, what does come into play? Is this kind of analysis, but also, I don't know, some kind of physical properties of your? Yeah, yeah. So I think if you, you set your security level, right, the number of measurements that we want to resist, that's your security goal then you need to, to know what's the noise that you will have in your implementation. If it's a software one, it's, pro, it's going to be fixed to the platform, and then you can really fix the D that you need. But uh, this analysis also gives you like the, the amount of information that you will maybe leak for, mm. for the type of adversary. But uh, so how do you interpret if that amount of information is enough? I mean, is, uh, I mean, is it I interpret it. For me, it's just it's, it's a bound on the worst case. There's no if if you if you bound a number of samples for key recovery as something related to one divided by DMI, or see a small constant divided by DMI, it really means that no adversary will do better than that. So this really bounds the data complexity that you need. And it does make sense to consider like on different parts of the circuit different D, D different D. I don't know if uh, because uh, it depends on the, um, maybe if it depends where it's implemented. Uh, yeah. The adversary may have more control. So that's the final question. I would say, in theory, I don't think so. Uh, it's, it's risky if you mask less in the middle. Uh, concretely, most of the attacks that we know, they exploit the first and last cipher rounds. So all these attacks exploiting, all, like these analy analytical attacks that I mentioned in the end, uh, they also only work if you know a lot about the implementation details. So that's, uh, but, but to be safe, the answer is no. I, w I would not do it. So let's thanks Francois Xavier again and all the speakers.